As an ethnographer, I begin in story. Maria is a Brazilian woman studying in Russia. She was initially accepted to immigrate to Canada, but then not eligible because she was diagnosed with HIV. Estrella is a Filipino woman working in Canada. She has applied to have her son join her, but her request was denied because he lives with a genetic condition. Ravine is an Indian woman living in Canada with her daughter. They applied for permanent residency, but their case was refused because her daughter lives with a disability. These are examples of what being made medically inadmissible looks for people with chronic illness and developmental or genetic otherness. As a former community social worker turned researcher, I have listened to many stories about people's medical uh, immigration. People experience contradictions and tensions stemming from the institutional assessment and evaluation of their bodies. Analytically, these tensions and contradictions are very valuable points of entry into which to then open up and study an immigration system from the bottom up. My name is Laura Bizayon. I'm a sociologist and professor of health and society. I study the people, politics, and places related to migration, health, and the state. I have written a book and also made a film about the Canadian immigration system and its treatment of people with HIV. Today I'll be talking about a barrier for immigration to Canada called medical inadmissibility. Welcoming the fit and filtering out the rest is a long-standing state strategy that has existed since the 19th century in Canada. It is a product and a remnant of British colonialism. Another colonial strategy practiced in Canada was to discourage the immigration of non-white persons. I am flanked by the bronze statue entitled Mama Barenka. It was made by Antillean Dutch sculptor Nelson Carillo. It honors the life lost of Kervin Lucas Dunmeyer, a teenager who was killed in central Amsterdam because he was black. Racism and disabilism are demeaning and devaluing. Their effects are felt most bluntly by people who are racialized and disabled. While Canadians would march in the streets if their immigration system did not welcome people on the basis of their skin color as it once did, cur the current system is, is not built to welcome people with chronic illness or developmental or genetic otherness. The Canadian public is generally unaware of these circumstances. The international public is generally aghast when they find out about these issues. I am told that medical inadmissibility chafes with people's image of Canada as a nation of equity. Over about 15 years, I have sought answers to questions I have had about how the immigration medical inadmissibility system works. My research demonstrates that Canada's immigration system is brought into being by the coordinated work practices of functionaries and professionals, for example, lawyers and doctors. And this is similar to how immigration systems around the world are organized. Inside and outside of Canada, these men and women interpret and create a record on each applicant for permanent residency. And through their records, People like Marie, Maria, Estrella, and Ravine, who I mentioned earlier, are socially pr produced as being legal, cost, and health risks. And this is the very basis for their exclusion. So while my research focuses on the Canadian immigration context, the bulk of the 500,000 annual immigration medical examinations happen outside of Canada. This directly affects would-be immigrants as well as workers working around the world. And I am currently researching these spaces and places around the world. I'm working ethnographically and I am observing, interviewing and reviewing contemporary and historical materials. While there's a sizable and growing literature on immigration, deportation, and detention, academic research on post-exclusion as sets of embodied experiences with institutional processes is scarce. Focusing on would-be would permanent immigrants' uh, return and readjustment to their home societies or not is analytically fruitful because it compels us to ask several questions. What are people's daily efforts to reside or re, uh, remain like? What do they look like and feel like? 
their imagining work, their legal work, their effective work, their financial work, as a result of being made medically inadmissible? How do institutional barriers enable and constrain people's lives? And ultimately, what do these lives end up being about when people cannot immigrate permanently? I'm asking our institutions to take notice of how systemic disadvantage is upheld through professional and bureaucratic practices. And I'm joining with calls from within Canada and the European Union to produce empirical evidence to suppress institutional barriers based on bodily status. And finally, I'm inviting us all collectively to reflect on the contributions of people with chronic illness and developmental or genetic otherness who are our neighbors, our family, and our friends, perhaps ourselves. I hope that my work will be useful to help reform the Canadian system. I live in the hope that the country will shed once and for all its colonial baggage by casting aside prejudice based on people's health condition. And there's a promissory note here. Canadian, the Canadian immigration system did indeed rid earlier forms of prejudice based on skin color. And so doing the same for people with chronic illness and developmental or genetic otherness is certainly possible. It's definitely doable.